Hey everyone, happy Easter. I know it's an unlikely Easter this year. We're not together. Maybe some of you are in your pajamas and still have a cup of coffee in your hand, but I just wanna say we have so much to celebrate today. Jesus is alive, he is risen, the tomb is empty, and we have so much to rejoice about today. So get up off your feet, get on your knees, cry, scream, dance, whatever you wanna do today, because we are gonna worship like he is alive because he is. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for today, Lord. I thank you so much for the opportunity for us to worship today. I thank you, Lord, that you are alive, that you are not contained by a tomb and you're not contained by a building. You are alive and active. So God, would you pour out your power and your presence today on every single home where anyone is tuning in today? Would you overwhelm us with your presence and your power today, that we would worship you really about who you are today. In Jesus' name, amen. Ready and go ahead. Church, happy Resurrection Sunday. We want you guys, wherever you are, to stand on your feet and let's worship our risen Savior today. We're gonna open up with Empty Grave this morning. We did it uh, last week, let's do it again today. Here we go. It says this, see, and every demon shakes as we shout your praise, all the souls have rolled away. Yeah, you have robbed the grave, so we celebrate your eternal victory. Yeah, come on, Briggs. Hey. So shout, O Zion, shout in triumph, cause death. Because you have 
So shout, O Zion, shout and try it out, because Jesus is alive. Clap your hands right where you are.
Say this with me. Say, oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For in less days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. verse with me says, I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior of that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stones. Messiah still and all alone. Sing the chorus. Everybody lift it up. Say, oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, our God. <laughs> This is where you get excited. If in all the third, good God, at break of dawn, yeah, the Son of heaven rose again. Say, no trample death. Where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the
if you're just tuning in with us, we're in the middle of our online worship experience. Thank you so much for tuning in with us today. If it's your first time ever connecting with the Bridge Church at all, maybe someone shared this with you or you just came across it on social media or YouTube, I just want to say that we're so encouraged and thankful that you're taking part of this today and we just welcome you. We've made it really easy for you to get connected, even in this season where it seems like we're all disconnected, we want to connect with you. There's a link right now in the comment section called Get Connected. We'd love for you to fill it out. We'd love to know your name, what kind of brought you here today to stumble across this, and how we can pray for and support you. Now we're gonna continue to worship by giving of our offering. This is something that we do each week at The Bridge Church because we really want our hearts to be tied to the things that God loves and His mission and His purposes. So I just wanna invite you into that today. I know it's weird, we're not passing buckets, we're not in the same building, maybe you've never given online before, but right now you can find the link to give in our comment section, and I'd encourage you to follow those directions and get started with giving today. In this season especially, if you're able to give, I encourage you to maybe even give above and beyond what you normally give. Because these seasons, we're gonna all need to contribute to one another, and we wanna be able to be resourced well to help, our, help each other and help our city in this time. So I encourage you, invite you into that, and we're gonna continue to worship. Hey, happy Easter Bridge family. It is so good to be with you today on Easter Sunday for this online worship experience. Um, obviously a little bit different today, but nonetheless, we come together to celebrate um, Easter and the resurrection. These are unprecedented days that we find ourselves in. I don't think any of us would have imagined that we would ever be spending Easter Sunday um, this way. It is such a bizarre moment that we <clears throat> are in, but we come together uh, today really to celebrate a, a hope that was designed for this uh, moment. Um, the U.S. Surgeon General, even this past week, he came out and said that this was going to be the hardest and saddest week yet as it is related to the coronavirus. It's tragic and devastating to really watch what is happening in our culture. But what I want to encourage with uh, you today is that we have a hope that is perfectly designed for this moment, and that hope is the gospel. You see, it seems the entire world right now is quarantined, but there's one thing that you cannot quarantine, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, his life, his death, and his resurrection. And so we come together today to celebrate that reality. And particularly, uh, we come today to focus our attention on the resurrection, the single greatest event in the history of the world. No moment, no event, no situation, no circumstance has transformed the fabric of humanity more than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Historians even tell us that around the time of the first century, there were literally quite a few dozen of messianic movements that happened in and around the first century. But what would happen is every time one of these messianic leaders would die, inevitably their followers would all pack up their bags and go home because the move movement would have ended, except for one. Only one of these movements survived, and that was Christianity. And what transformed a group of ragtag fishermen and tax collectors um, into the greatest movement in the history of the world was the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. And so what I would love to show us today and for us to look at today is as followers of Jesus, we have within us this very same power, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead. The title of today's sermon is this, Same Power. It's the same power. So would you pray with me? Father, today we are grateful to come together as your people and to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Help us today, Lord, to believe that we have a hope for this moment, that we have a power within us, the very same power that actually rose Jesus Christ from the dead. And we say this in Jesus' good name. Amen. Our text for today is going to be Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, verses 9, 10, and 11. This is what it says, Romans 8, verse 9. It says this, You, however, Paul speaking to me and you as believers, if you're a follower of Jesus today, you, how, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. And it says, Anyone who does not have the Spirit of, of Christ does not belong to him. What we see here is Paul begins to unpack this theme that's really throughout the entire Bible. It's this reality of the flesh and the spirit. 
um, earthly realities and then spiritual realities. You could say um, physical realities and spiritual realities. We see this all throughout the Bible. What we need to recognize today is that we have, we, li we live in a world that is um, unbelievably not only physical, but is a spiritual world. We, we live in a world that is vastly um, spiritual, and, and that is the reality of the world that we live in. In fact, you know, we've, we've, all got, we've all got one of these. We've all got a cell phone in our pockets, and it's amazing to me how this little device works. And apparently right now, this is what people tell me, is that there is some kind of signal or some kind of waves that are being transmitted right now from this little device to towers and things all over, all, all around me. Um, the way that this device works is that there is something invisible, there's something unseen that is allowing me to operate with this in my pocket. See, I bet if we could actually see cell phone signals and radio signals and TV signals and GPS satellite signals around us, if we were able to see those realities, it would probably freak us out. See, we live right now around us, we, we live in a very spiritual world, not just a physical world. We, we live in a very, a vastly spiritual world. So then what does it mean to be human? What does it mean for you and me to be human? What is a human being? Well, we are physical beings. Um, we are matter, we have a visible body, a physical body with organs and muscles and skin and blood, but that's only half of our existence. That's only half of it. We are also spiritual beings. We are immaterial. We're not just material beings, we're also immaterial beings. I was so um, just reminded of this this past summer. My wife and I, along with a team of people from the bridge, were able to go to Haiti, as, as we do on a regular basis, and partner there with a ministry that is in Haiti. And um, while we were there, we got the incredible opportunity to actually meet a voodoo priest. In Haiti, voodoo is, is pretty significant, it's pretty prevalent, and um, a voodoo is a very spiritual kind of um, religion. Well, we had the opportunity to, to meet a voodoo priest. We actually went inside the temple, quite bizarre, I won't go into all the details, but then we began with a translator to have a conversation with this voodoo priest. And what was interesting is about a couple minutes into the conversation, I thought that I would get a little bit bold, and I began to um, ask this voodoo priest questions about his own life and his own spirituality. And so I asked a pretty bold question. I said, hey, how often do you actually talk to spirits? And the voodoo priest, he responded immediately, and he said, well, I'm actually talking to a spirit right now who is telling me what to say in response to your questions. And at that point, the team was like, wow, okay, this is next level. And I would begin to ask the, um, the, the voodoo priest, what was the spirit's name? And he would tell me the name. What are the other spirits that you talk to? He would begin to name off other spirits uh, um, immediately. And then he would begin to tell me the, the order and, and the ranking of different spirits that were in his area. You see, we live in a, in a very spiritual world. And you're like, Ethan, do you believe that that was actually true? Yeah, I believe that there are spirits that are all over this place. There are spirits that work for our enemy, Satan. And then we have angelic beings that are a part of God's kingdom. See, we live in a very, very spiritual world. If, if we were able to understand and to see all the spiritual realities around us, I believe that it would completely freak us out. All that to say, I would argue that so much of what it means to be you is not just your physical self, but is also your spiritual self. Really, the essence of who you are is your spiritual self. Your body is significant, but it's mainly the housing for you, for your spiritual self. It's kind of like a car. You know, a car has many different parts. A car has, has a frame and a structure that everything is built on. And then it has a body that kind of is the outward shell of the car. But what makes a, a car a car is, isn't those things. It's really the engine. Uh, without the engine, I mean, it's just a, a hunk of metal and plastic. In, in similar way, your body is the housing for your spiritual self for you, which then brings up a greater question. Well, if this is true, then what happens to our existence after our bodies die? Well, once your body dies, your existence continues for all of us. Upon death, you don't cease to exist, as the atheist or the naturalist would argue. You're not just physical matter, you are a spiritual being. Now, many would refer to this as the afterlife, which, you know, I don't know, maybe isn't necessarily a great term because after death, you're still living. You're still existing. Life goes on. I mean, it's obviously very different, but you live on. So then, what happens to us after death? What happens to our existence after death? Well, the, the Bible would say that um, there are two dwelling places, only two dwelling places um, for our existence after death. The first is heaven. 
The first is heaven. The Bible says this is the realm or the kingdom or the abode of the righteous with God. For those who have submitted themselves to God in faith and trusted Christ and had the death of Jesus wash away their sin and make them righteous, you and I will then live and have our being and abode with God forever in heaven. The second place the Bible talks about is what is referred to as Gehenna. Now, in the Old Testament, there was actually a valley just outside the city walls of Jerusalem. It was referred to as the Valley of Hinnom or the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom. And the word Hinnom there is translated into Greek as Gehenna. And the King James translators would translate that word Gehenna into English as hell. In the Old Testament, Gehenna was a really a wicked, detestable place um, where all sorts of pagan worship would take place, including child sacrifice. They would quite literally uh, burn children alive as a part of their worship to the god Baal or Baal. And then God's people would even, through King Ahaz and King Manasseh in the 7th century, they would even participate in this pagan worship in these ceremonies and child sacrifices. By the time of the 1st century, in Jesus' day, this valley um, had become really a trash pit outside of the city of Jerusalem where they would burn a refuse um, as well as the dead bodies of criminals. There was a constant fire, history tells us, that was burning all the time and it would just burn unendingly. It was really a fiery abyss, people would call it, or a lake of fire. And the Bible would use that term, Gehenna, that valley, as a way to articulate the existence of those um, after their body dies, who are not followers of Jesus, who have not yet submitted themselves to God, who do not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God within them. And the Bible also tells us that Gehenna, or hell, it's a place of eternal torment, absent of God. It's the final home and dwelling place of Satan and his demons and all those who do not submit to God. It is a lake of fire. Now, <clears throat> What's happened in our culture is we've kind of turned this into a joke. When we throw around the word hell casually for whatever circumstance we want, it's just flippantly we use this word. But what we should not be deceived to believe is that this is not a, a real place where many will suffer in eternal torment. And those who have not trusted Christ and surrendered their life to God through the power of the gospel will spend an eternity um, apart from God in hell. All that to say, one of Paul's main points here, what he's trying to get us to understand is that you, you are a very a physical being, but you're also a very spiritual being. If you look back at the verses in Romans 8, verses 9 and 10, it says this, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But verse 10, if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Here's Paul's big point. If you have Christ in you, if you have the Spirit of God in you, that fundamentally changes the game. He uses the language here of your body being dead or your body being lifeless. He uses this concept elsewhere um, as well. Paul's basically saying without Christ, without the Spirit of Christ in you, you are spiritually dead. And unless God is in you, you don't actually have spiritual life in you. Which this, I think, begs the question, why then is Christ such a big deal? Why so much emphasis on him? Well, the reason is because what, what Christ has done in the gospel is actually the power that brings your soul to life through the spirit of God. So what is the gospel? Well, the gospel is the good news that God is reconciling the world to himself and to itself through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. This is why this is such a big deal. Here's our problem. God cannot live or dwell within us because we are broken. We're depraved. We're unfortunately fallen. We're, we're dirty. We're diseased because of our sin. It, it would be like, you know, you know, you inviting someone that currently has the coronavirus into your home and eating at your dinner table with them or actually sleeping in the same bed with them. I mean, that would never happen. I mean, you just wouldn't do that. It's not even a consideration. The only way that you would do that is if you knew that they had been healed and the virus was completely gone. And that's what the gospel has done for us in a spiritual sense. But how? How, how has the gospel done this? Well, two things, the cross and the resurrection. First of all, the cross. Everyone these days seems to be wearing a cross around their necks, but I think we fail to understand the magnitude of Christ at crucifixion. See, back in the first century, Roman crucifixion, 
It was the most gruesome, um, most painful, most torturous of deaths imaginable. In the first century, um, Josephus, the historian, um, he would say that it was the most wretched of deaths. Cicero would even say that Roman citizens shouldn't even mention crucifixion. It shouldn't even, even come off their lips. Crucifixion, crucifixion rather, was really it was a state-sanctioned terror exercised on the worst of crimes for the worst of criminals. Suffering from crucifixion was um, just unimaginable. In fact, there's even a, a word that was um, used to articulate, it was created to articulate how ex extenuous this suffering was. It's the term excruciating, which literally means from the cross. Even when Spartacus revolted against the Romans and was eventually defeated, um, Crassus, he crucified 6,000 followers of Spartacus on a 120-mile stretch of highway from Rome to Capua. I mean, it's just unimaginable. E even before someone was crucified, they would go through the process of what is referred to as flogging or scourging, which are beatings. A, per a person would typically be tied to a post and they would be beaten with a flagrum or a cat of nine tails. This would be a wooden handle with several leather strands that um, often had a, a piece of bone or metal or porcelain fastened to the end of each strand. It'd be used like a whip to tear the skin and the flesh off of the victim's body. And many wouldn't even survive the scourging process. And then once the scourging was finished, the victim would be required to carry their crossbar to the side of their crucifixion. And then once they got there, if they made it, large metal spikes would be driven through their hands and feet into the cross to ensure that they could not be removed from it. And then once upon the cross, a person would fight to survive by lifting their body upwards in unbelievable pain to allow air to flow into their lungs. And victims would often go in and out of consciousness and would even lose control of their bodily functions. Many would only last a few hours before dying, but some would hang there for days fighting the blazing heat of the day and trying to avoid shock during the cool night. Death from crucifixion typically happened through asphyxiation, where a victim ultimately lost the ability to intake air into their lungs. And that's what God did for us. See, Jesus hung on a cross and experienced death for you. You see, the cross was supposed to be for you. Jesus took it in your place. And while hanging on the cross during the last moments of his life, he would even look out amidst his accusers and his revilers, and he would pray to the Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, upon Jesus' death, his body would be taken down from the cross by a man named Joseph of Arimathea, and he would lay Jesus' dead body in a grave or in a tomb that was dug out of the side of a rock and Rome would then have an incredibly large stone that was rolled in front of the opening of that tomb to prevent anyone from tampering with the body. And then even in addition to that, Rome had a guard of soldiers sent to police the grave 24-7 to deter anyone from tampering with the grave. And at that moment, Jesus was dead. His body was lifeless, dark, lying in a cold tomb. The Galilean peasant carpenter rabbi from Nazareth, Nazareth was dead and gone. But you see, then the unthinkable happened. Early on Sunday morning, two women who were followers of Jesus, they went as is a normal custom to treat the body of Jesus with spices. And when they got to the tomb, the stone was gone and they didn't know what happened. Jesus' body wasn't inside the tomb. And Mary, one of the women there, was, was weeping. And the scriptures tell us that the resurrected Jesus in his whole healthy body came and met her and revealed himself first to her. You see, in that grave, in that tomb, the Spirit of God invaded that place. The Spirit of God came into the darkness. And the heart that wasn't beating and the body that was, was broken and the muscles that had no life in them, the Spirit of God began to breathe resurrection into the body of Jesus. And Jesus' skin would come back together. His muscles would begin to heal. His heart would begin to develop. His lung would begin to, to breathe. And the Spirit of God would breathe life into him. 
Jesus' followers immediately after that, for the next few minutes and for the next few hours, would be blown away that Jesus was no longer dead but was alive. The unimaginable happened. Jesus, they realized, finally, he beat our greatest foe, our greatest enemy of death itself. You see, at the end of the day, death is our greatest enemy. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your religion is. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Death is coming for you. It's your greatest foe, and there's nothing that you can do to stop it. But what if there was something even more powerful than death itself? What if there was something that had the ability to actually conquer death itself? You see, this is what the resurrection is. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 57, death is swallowed up in victory, quoting Isaiah. He would say, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's why the resurrection is critical for us. Paul says this in our last verse, verse 11. If the spirit of him, this is the spirit of God, if the spirit of him, who raised Jesus from the dead, dwells in you or lives in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. See, Christ defeated death, not by intellect, not by strength, not by money. He defeated death by the spirit of God. The spirit of God actually came and breathed new life into Jesus, into his dead body. The Spirit of God resurrected him and overcame death. And now as Jesus' followers, Paul tells us, we have that same power in us. Paul would even say in Ephesians 1, verses 19 and 20, knowing what is the immeasurable, immeasurable greatness of his power toward us, toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. So here's the good news, church. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead, the same spirit of God through faith in, and trust in the gospel now lives in us. It's the same. Knowing this, therefore, we step into the world. We, we step into the chaos. We step into this moment. We find ourselves in this moment and we step in with power and boldness. And the reason why the Christian should not fear right now is because we know that even if we die, even if we suffered a disease, even if we suffered some kind of persecution that is fatal, death cannot stop us. The grave cannot hold us. We are victorious in Christ. Let's pray. God, today we thank you for this good news of the resurrection. We thank you that Spirit of God rose Jesus from the dead, and we thank you that that same Spirit lives in us. And God, would you let that reality change us forever? Hey, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed together wherever you are right now, I just want to give you the opportunity. I don't know where you are or what you might be doing or where you come from or you're listening today. I would just say, do you know Christ today is is the Spirit of God in you? Have you ever given your life to Jesus? Today, I would say, give your life to Christ. Give your life to Christ today. He will forgive you. He will accept you. He will change you. He will make you new. Today, with your your head bowed and your eyes closed, I would just say, offer up a prayer today if you want to make that step in faith today and say something like this. Say, God, today I trust you. Today I trust in Jesus. I trust in his life, his death, and his resurrection for me. And today I believe you are making me new. In Christ's name, amen. Well, happy Easter, everyone. I hope you have a great day. It's so good to be able to celebrate the resurrection with you. Hey, Bridge family. We're going to continue to worship through communion. We heard some really, really good news today. The same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead resides in you through the Holy Spirit. As we take communion together, let's remember three things. One, let's remember that when Jesus took this bread in front of his disciples, he said, take this, eat it, and remember me. Remember that Jesus had to be broken for our sin. Remember that someone had to take your place. He also took this cup and said, drink it in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant. It represents the new covenant. We were washed in Jesus' blood. So I just want you to remember those two things, but don't forget the third thing. As often as you take the bread and drink the cup, You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Never forget that our Savior is risen. 
He's overcome sin. He's overcome the grave. He's overcome death. So I just want to encourage you through the resurrection today as we take communion together. for worshiping with us today. We were super encouraged to be able to chat with you. I hope that you were encouraged as well. We're gonna be doing this every single week at 10 o'clock, as long as we need to, to be able to connect and worship together. So I encourage you to tune in again next Sunday at 10 on our YouTube channel or on our social media pages. Once again, like I said earlier, if it was your first time ever worshiping with us, please let us know who you are so we can connect with you. 
You can find that link right now in our comment section. Fill that out. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to support you, especially today if you took the step to follow Jesus. We want to know about that, and we want to connect with you. Every week when we're together, when we're, when we're ending our worship gathering, we say, as you go, go making disciples. And I just want to remind you again, God has you here on purpose. He knew the season was going to happen. He's not confused by our current circumstances. And you have purpose right now. So let's access that same power that rose Christ from the dead that lives in us this week. And Bridge Church, as you go, go making disciples.